I had the capability though of achieving anything I wanted to achieve. I had that installed in my mindset from my mom at an early age. The lessons in my life have happened after breakups. I don't really believe in bad days anymore. I believe in bad moments. My darkest demons are definitely gonna be something to do with filling up the void with behaviors that don't fulfill my future anymore. Do you feel like you were running away though? I definitely did. But at the time it felt what I needed to do. I was connecting at a deep level now with my friends and co-workers through drugs. How do you build good habits? We are, who we are today is a reflection of our habits. I got addicted to watching porn. I've stopped doing casual sex because it's not meaningful. I was surrounded by feminine energy and I became someone who was a lot more comfortable in my feminine energy. I understood that I needed to have a balance. I'm gonna go and fucking battle my demons and I'm gonna come out of it like a warrior. What are some of your goals at the moment? I've written two books and so at the moment I am heavily focused on finishing the books. It's like giving birth for a man I feel like. <laughs> so what is love to you? Love is... Before we jump into today's episode, I have a small favor to ask from you. If you've gotten any value from any of the podcasts, any of the content that I have put out, please hit the subscribe button. It honestly helps me so much. It helps this channel in growing and as you've seen, as the channel grows, the guests get bigger and better, which means I can provide more knowledge and more value to you, the listener. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. Thomas Malicelli. <laughs> Ciao. Welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you so much for making the trip out here, the hour drive from Bondi to, to sit in the studio, have this conversation. We've already connected prior and man, it's going to be a cracker of a conversation. Man, I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. Where do I start this? What do we need to know about you, the earliest context about yourself, to better understand the man that's sitting in front of us today. Like we can tell by your accent, you weren't born in Australia. Mm. So where were you born? What was your upbringing like? And how you ended up here today? Good question. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm Italian originally. I was born and raised in Italy. Mum is English. So I was brought up bilingual. That's why I have a bit of a strange accent. Mm -hmm. Um, my life back in Italy was a very simple life. I was brought up in a farm. I was, uh, looking after animals and, um, doing all the really simple jobs that at the time I hated because my friends were all outside, usually playing soccer or with motorbikes and I had to like do my chores. But now I really, I really miss them and I really respect them because they've taught me so much and they've helped me become who I am today. So very simple upbringing, farm, uh, organic vegetables, lots of animals. And then, um, I guess most of the lessons in my life have happened, uh, after breakups. And, uh, I started dating this girl back in Italy. So I was with her for five years, we had a beautiful relationship and then we broke up. And, um, after we broke up, I was, uh, 23 at the time. And I had my first moment of somewhat depression. I didn't know what it was, but I was feeling really low. And that led me to look at opportunities to leave Italy because I didn't want to be in the country with that person anymore. And uh, I searched for opportunities online to go and work for hospitality. That was my background. America came up, Disney World for a, for a whole year. I accepted, left Italy and then never came back again. Yeah, wow. Do you feel like you were running away though? I did. I did. I, d I definitely did. But at the time it felt what I needed to do. Yeah. And looking back, I am so grateful I did because if I would have stayed in that town, I probably would have be still there, probably with the same girlfriend and I wouldn't have, um, experienced the world like I have done now. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from traveling? Cause I assume you've, you've traveled a fair bit, you've been around and you've experienced different cultures and I feel the best way to learn about the world, learn about yourself is to actually get out there and experience it. What, what have been some of your biggest lessons that have helped you in, in today? You know, the biggest one is knowing that I'm going to be okay, no matter what. I remember leaving Italy by myself to America. I had, uh, I think at the time, like a thousand five hundred dollars in my account and yeah, I had my mom at home, but whatever, that, that was not the point. No, no one. And I did know that. I had the capability though of achieving anything I wanted to achieve. I had that installed in my mindset from my mom at an early age. And so always putting myself in situations where I knew nobody, I knew nothing, but I knew that I had the capability of achieving. And so when I went to America, that was very uncomfortable, but with that mindset, I was able to attract some really good opportunities and people and, and obviously networking. 
And then same thing in Australia. When I came here, same kind of jump, same leap of faith, not knowing anyone, but knowing kind of where I, where I wanted to go. And knowing that at the core, I knew what I wanted. And um, even though it scared me, that was a lesson, I knew that was going to be okay. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can 100% agree with that because for me, like the first 20 odd years of my life, I just lived in my comfort zone. I was like, I don't want to jump out of it. This so it's like the fear of the unknown. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And for me being like naturally shy, quite like that introverted kid, I don't know. Were you introverted or extroverted? Introverted. Yeah. Very okay. shy as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to connect a lot here. Yeah. First of all, what from being naturally shy, introverted kid, what made you actually go, fuck, I need to step out of my comfort zone here? A series of lessons. So I was unaware of many things. Uh, I actually started to become aware of my childhood traumas um, only probably four years ago. Uh, so throughout my life, throughout my 20s, I had this idea. I had this ego egotistical side of myself and I, I knew that I was shy. I knew that I didn't like to do certain things. I didn't know why though. I didn't even, even really search for a meaning. Then um, when I became an entrepreneur, I started, started going to wellness events, personal development events. Um, I became a little bit more spiritual. Um, I then dived into ayahuasca as well. And I was confronted with uh, lessons and uh, feelings that I didn't really know how to understand before. That then took me to the point where, okay, I am a certain way because during my childhood, I had, for example, my father passed away when I was really young. I, um, I was rejected from my father, even though they remember, but my mom then told me, and then I managed to put one on one together and I was like, okay, this makes sense. I understand why I'm a certain way now. And so understanding that they made me want to dwell into bettering myself. And like you said, when I went to a, to a personal development course once, the, the coach was teaching us about comfort zone and what happens in a comfort zone. And obviously what happens out of the comfort zone, I'm someone that wants success. I want to impact people. I want to have, you know, great relationships. I want to have great sex and all of these great things only happen out of the comfort mm -hmm. zone. And I was like, okay, every day I'm going to try and do something that can push me out a little bit of my comfort zone so I can grow and expand. And that's been my philosophy since I became aware. Yeah, that's very similar to this journey. As I said, first 20 years of my life, comfort zone. Then I started this podcast and just every time I'd step into this realm, I'd be like, so nervous, so scared. But after it, it's like that sense of confidence of, I can do this. And the more repetitions you put in, the more confident you get. And now I can walk into a room like this and hold a conversation and, and feel confident with myself knowing, all right, I can do this. But it's just by taking that first step and keep taking those steps. Yeah. And I think it's understanding that the comfort zone is has its pros and cons. Like you need to step out of it to gain the confidence and to grow, but also coming back to your comfort because that's where you recharge the batteries. And especially for an introvert, knowing that if you're continually going out of your comfort zone and interacting with people, it can be very draining, very overwhelming, very stressful. So you need that comfort to come back at the end of the day or before you even start your day doing your morning routine so your batteries are charged. Yeah. If not, if you don't charge the batteries, you're just running on empty. Absolutely. And then you're just going to be a stress head. You can go into poor mental health then. It's about understanding your energy systems and understanding who you are and how you function. And that's the biggest thing that I've learned, especially understanding what introvert is. But I had no clue what it was. I just thought, I don't like people. I just like to be by myself. But no, I actually love communication. I love connecting with people, but I also need my alone time. Like that's my favorite time. Yes. So it's, it all comes down to self-awareness at the end yes. of the day. It's the biggest thing. Yes. For you... Coming to Australia, was, why Why Australia? What land did you hear? Yeah, so Australia, I, when I left for America, I got the travel bug and I was like, I want to experience the world. And at the time, I was with a girlfriend of mine who we had the same values, same interest. Um, and um, we were in America, living in New York. And I posed the question, I was like, are we going to settle in New York or should we keep traveling? I wanted to visit Australia because I had some friends here. And so I said to her, why don't we go to Australia for just one year? 
we go there, we travel, we explore, come back to the States. She was like, yeah, let's do it. So we got our visa and our, and our tickets in literally two days, came to Australia. And then my background is hospitality. So I came here, left my resume in this restaurant in Sydney, got hired right away. And then after three months, they offered us a sponsorship. And I was like, okay, this could be interesting. Maybe, maybe we'll stay for just two years. And then the magic happened. We stayed longer. We fell in love with, with the beaches, with the lifestyle. And you haven't now left. I haven't left. It's been 11 <laughs> years now. 11 years, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people come here and don't leave. What, what is it about Australia that you love? I just love the lifestyle. And like the opportunity is really good as well. And mostly just the way of living. Like I, I live in Bondi Beach now. And uh, I just love waking up. I just love looking at the ocean. I just love going in the water. Fantastic. Talk to me about hospitality and that period of your life where you felt very drained and you felt like you were kind of stuck in that job and you couldn't get out of it. What was that like and how did you get out of that position? Because I feel like as a society, we're doing things because we feel like we have to do it. We have to do this job. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you don't. We all have a choice at the end of the day. Yeah. So for you, you could have stayed in that path because of good pain, I'm assuming, very comfortable. Yeah. What made you leave and how did you get out of that? Yeah, a few factors. Um, I found my dream career in this restaurant. I started off as a waiter back in 2012, then became the venue manager in 2014, I think it was. And uh, when I was working in this restaurant, uh, I was having the best time. I was getting paid really well. But then I suddenly started to fall into a bit of toxic behaviors where I was... Again, because I'm shy, I was connecting with my coworkers and friends through alcohol at the time. And then um, I started taking recreational drugs for the first time in Australia. And that caused, created something in my eyes at the time, magical. I was connecting at a deep level now with my friends and coworkers through drugs. And I was like, wow, I'm not shy anymore. I can do this. I feel, I feel people, it was, it was fantastic. And so for three years, every single weekend, I was constantly going on benders. I was constantly drinking alcohol. I was constantly taking recreational drugs. Um, weekends where I would easily spend $2,000 on cocaine, on MDMA, and live like a rock star. And then on the Monday morning, I would just feel so shit. Uh, but then that's the only thing I knew. And so I kept doing it every single weekend until one morning, I woke up in my apartment in Bondi Junction and I looked at myself in the mirror and I, I could literally see it all. I had bad posture. I had a gut. I was seeing no sun. I was white like the Casper ghost. I had bags under my eyes, um, no energy. I had snooze through, I think at that point, like nine alarms. And I just couldn't get up. And I, I knew deep inside that like something had to change right there. Because if I don't have my vitality, if I don't have my energy, like how can I even impact people? Um, and that was when I touched rock bottom. Mm. And uh, and that morning I asked for help. I asked for my partner. I said to her, look, uh, I think it's time for me to change my lifestyle. She had given me an ultimatum a couple of weeks beforehand and uh, I took action. So I started off with uh, nutrition and then fitness and then spirituality. We can break this down later if you want, but that's the path I took. And then in terms of uh, the restaurant, um, I found the vehicle of network marketing. So I was, um, I was always looking for a way out. So I always wanted three things in my life. I wanted to impact people. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to make a lot of money. I just didn't know exactly how I could do these three things. And um, so a person it took me to an event where I discovered lots of young entrepreneurs uh, having impact, making you know really good income. And I was exposed for the first time to the vehicle of network marketing. Didn't believe I could do it because again, I was really shy didn't know how to sell, didn't know how to talk to people, but I wanted the lifestyle. And so I said to myself, I'll learn. And that's what I did. So I got to work, I learned, I found a really good company. And then in the space of two years, I managed to retire from hospitality and um, replace my income with the online business. Yeah, wow. It just goes to show that anything's possible if you put your mind to it. Absolutely. There was this quote that I seen on your page. It says, when you have spent some some of your life listening to others, it takes bravery to listen to your own voice. What were other people saying and what was your own voice saying? Other people were saying, you can't do it. Other people were saying, this is the traditional path. Society wants us to do this. And because I was surrounded by those people, I was like, okay, I actually scared of coming out of this 
this bubble. Um, and when I started going to events with entrepreneurs, they were saying the opposite thing. They were saying, be the black sheep, like follow your dreams. You can do it. And that's when I realized how important proximity is. Proximity is so powerful. It can make you, or it can break you. You know, if you're hanging out with four smokers and you don't smoke, you'll be the fifth one very soon. If you hang out with four complainers and you don't complain and you're not negative, you're going to be very negative soon. Mm. On the opposite side, if you hang out with five or four millionaires and you're not, eventually you're going to become a millionaire. Well, positive mindset and so on. And that's where the penny dropped for me. So I had to, in one way, let go of a few friends that were toxic for me um, and um, slowly started to make my way out of the black hole that I was in and finally got towards living the life of my dreams. Yeah, it's, it's a big thing, the proximity. And it's it's not about essentially who you hang out with, it's what you're consuming up here. Yeah. Like we have podcasts, YouTube, like there's so much positive content out there. Yeah, you may be in a, not the best environment. If you can get out of it, great. But if you have to stay in that environment, like plug some good shit up here Absolutely. because it's going to make such a difference. Then you're going to build the confidence. Like, okay, I can leave this situation or you'll find a way out of it. Surround yourself with good people. But more like listen to good stuff. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. It's all about what you consume at the end of the day. Yes. For you, what did you what did you learn from surrounding yourself with, with good people? Because habits are the number one thing. Mm-hmm. How do you build good habits? I built good habits studying successful people. So initially I I wanted the results. I didn't have the habits and obviously, as we know, like we are, who we are today is a reflection of our habits. And, uh, I very soon realized that most successful people have a library mm-hmm. in their house. They've got really good books. Most successful people, uh, prioritize growth. Um, they will probably miss a meal, but they won't miss a book. And so that was the first penny that dropped for me. I was like, I need to start growing. Um, one of my favorite mentors is Jim Rohn and, um, he really emphasized the the importance of growth every day. He's like, if you're not growing, you're dying. And, uh, that was the first part for me, allocating time every single day where I can uh, grow my mindset. And for me, that looked like either reading a chapter of a book or listening to a podcast, um, personal development, usually. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing that I learned from surrounding myself with good people is yes personal development growth mindset is great but the number one priority should be your health Mm -hmm. because that's what goes like you need your health and i and i see it from you the shift from you know drugs alcohol feeling like that's what you need to do to fit in to being like okay no my health is number one here yeah and once you start prioritizing that how much better do you feel oh my god you can get out of bed with energy yeah like your health is always going to be with you. So you need to take care of it. Yes. For you, what are the biggest things when it comes to health that have, that have helped you throughout this journey? Yeah, that is such a good question. And, um, I think this quote is in the Bible. Uh, they say, look after your body, like it's a, as if it's a temple. Mm. And when you think about it, it's, it's, it's so simple, but it's so true. We've got this one body for this lifetime and they say, treat it like a temple, not like a wood, like a, a shed in a wood or something like a temple. So somebody you have to look, look after really, really well. And so biggest thing for me, obviously nutrition, making sure that I am uh, consuming very nutritious foods that are good for me. Um, secondly, exercise. And then third is going to be the exposure to nature and sunlight. If you want to break down that a little bit further with the nutrition for me is making sure that I am allocating, um, my macros in a day. So what really changed the most was knowing how much protein I needed in, in, in my day. Now, this is not like a make it or break it kind of thing, but, um, I understood that if I, um, am hitting my protein, uh, for the day, then I am going to be, uh, effectively managing my body well and performance and all the good things. And after that, hydration, mm-hmm. top tip here that I've learned the last couple of years, adding some Celtic salt or some hydrolytes to my water. Yep. You do that too? Yeah. Yeah. Or even lemon juice. Even like lemon, lemon juice. juice. Yeah. 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 It all helps. Don't drink the tap water. If they don't drink tap water, <laughs> have a filter at home. It's so important. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then thirdly, I got into 
fasting as well and um, eight years ago and um, i've been now fasting on and off pretty much every week for either 24 or 36 hours for longevity purposes so for health reasons now this is something that might you know not be suitable for everyone i can understand but like i looked at the health reasons behind it and i was like oh my gosh now that i know how good this is there's no way that i can't implement it in, in my in my lifestyle and it has really helped me so much in terms of um mental clarity in terms of memory in terms of skin health in terms of gut health and every single time i want to reset i just go in in a 36 hour fast or 48 40 hour fast and it's almost like taking your car to be service for your service in your body like you come back in a nice and on switched on it's fantastic yeah really so how often do you do it is it like weekly and i'm usually every monday yeah yeah so you fast for like 24 hours yeah 24 so 24 if i'm training on this on the tuesday or 36 if i'm not um, and the reason why I do this is for a human growth hormone. So in, in us guys, for example, if you fast for 24 hours, the human growth hormone, which is the anti-aging hormone, will spike up to almost 1,800%. So you're going to have better recovery, better performance, anti-aging. Um, but on top of that, you've got autophagy. So autophagy is that process where your body just goes and cleans up all of the old cells and recreates better cells, cleaner cells, flushes out toxins. Um, and when you think of autophagy, I think of energy. Mm -hmm. It's like um, energy comes, comes from our cells, right? And so the more vibrant our cells are, the more of an impact we're going to have with our energy. And for me, energy is my currency. And that's the only thing I really want to make sure that, I, that it's high and on every single day. And uh, fasting helps so much with that. I have to give that a go because I, I do a, a degree of fasting. So I don't eat till like 10 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, and... From when I wake up to like 10 a.m., I'm so clear up. Yeah. And then I eat, I'm like, so drowsy. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have eaten. I just keep it going. A lot of people do fast. Mm -hmm. And for you, like, how long have you been doing it for? Eight years. Eight years. And yeah. how do you go with doing that for, for that long, like 24 to 36 hours? Does it affect you? Like, yeah, when it comes, it comes in that it's a habit now, right? Yeah. Yeah. You build up that kind of tolerance. You get used to it. Yeah. So initially, when I first started, I was like, no way. Like I love food too much. I was, I was heavily detoxing the first month when I was fasting. So I was fasting once a week and um, migraines, like I was tired. I was lethargic. I had, I was more tired than usual, but that was, that's because my body was heavily detoxing. Mm -hmm. And then once I started to get used to it, then I started to, um, flip on the opposite side and I got all the benefits from it. And now um, it's 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 a beautiful process where you, where I can just recalibrate, where I can just reset. Um, you know, if you want to talk, if you want to talk spiritually as well, fasting is one of those things that really help you feel more. Because, like for me in the past, food has always been yes a way of nourishing myself, but also a way of distracting myself. If I'm bored, I eat. Yeah. If I'm feeling um, if I'm not if I'm feeling something that's bothering me. I eat to distract myself. When you're fasting, you don't eat. And so you are constantly um, feeling what comes up. And that really helps understand who you are at your core. And so you get really close to your spiritual side. And there's days where my fasts are incredible because I'm in a, in a great mood. And there's days where I am confronting my darkest, deepest demons. And that's also okay because I'm getting to know myself more. Yeah, it forces you to deal with your shit. Yes. Instead of escaping during, like through food. Yes. Yeah, wow. Well, what are some of the deepest demons that have come up during your fast? <laughs> there's, there's, there's definitely been a lot. Uh, for me, it's, it's mostly due with uh, some negative emotions like anger and like guilt and sometimes loneliness as well. Um, I was someone that was distracting myself so much back in my 20s with... Um, yeah, as I said, with alcohol, with, with porn, with, with drugs, to escape a certain feeling. And, and now there's often times when I fast and I do get bored and my unconscious mind sometimes tends to go back to what I used to do back in my 20s. And so I catch that thought and I think to myself, isn't that interesting? And often I, I, I battle because I want to go back to that old behavior, but then... I've got procedures in place now where I just stop the thought and just focus on something else. So the, my darkest demons are definitely going to be something to do with uh, filling up the void with uh, behaviors that don't fulfill my future anymore. Mm. Why do you feel like you go 
naturally go back to those behaviors. Because I wrote something this morning, a man without purpose seeks, um, what was it? Seeks pleasure. seeks pleasure through escapism. Yes. So drugs, alcohol, porn, that's yeah. a form of escapism because yeah. we don't have, if you're on purpose, you're fucking zoned in. So for you, why do you feel like you go back to those old habits? Is this like a bad day? Like you don't feel like you're on purpose or? Yeah, I've got some, there, there's been, I, I don't, I don't really believe in bad days anymore. Like I believe in bad moments. So I have mm-hmm. a bad moment and then uh, when I'm having that moment, I decide to change my state and change the tra- trajectory of my life. But it does happen in moments where I'm either bored or I'm lonely. Uh, mm-hmm. Bored because I have done a bunch of things and my mind just tries and find something that is wrong for some reason. Um, and this is fasting. Fasting brings us up. And that's why I love fasting as well, because it builds resilience in me. Um, and then lonely because I, um, I have learned so many lessons in terms of relationship. And I, I, was, I'm, I'm, I, I love myself a lot and I love being with myself. But I haven't quite found my partner in crime yet, and so there's sometimes where I'm feeling lowly in that department. Yeah, you get, you get caught up, like yeah, yeah, you love yourself, but still, it's still good to have that other person. Then you mentioned getting caught up in pornography. Has that been a, a struggle for you? Because I feel like it, as a society, it's so even myself, you, we get drawn into it, and you do it, and it's just like, what the fuck did I just do? Like, why did I do that? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I am going to become a more of a voice now soon about pornography because I, I got addicted to watching porn from the age of like, I don't know, like 18. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a lie. 16. Um, I was about 14, bro. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, I was watching porn pretty much every day and, uh, I didn't know the time, but it was impacting my relationships. It was impacting my intimacy with my partners. And um, there were there came, there came a time where I just wasn't appreciating being intimate with my partner because I could just picture these perfect, perfect images of what I would see in porn and I wouldn't be turned on by my partner anymore. They didn't know at the time, you know, I wasn't aware. And then I came across somebody, I think on YouTube, there was talking about the, the bad effects of pornography on a man's mind, uh, brain, and it just made complete sense. And so I'm someone that's very much hot and cold. Once I understood the reasons why, I just stopped watching porn completely. And uh, I cannot tell you how much that has improved my mental health, my relationship, and my intimacy as well. Because mm-hmm. it, it even kills your own confidence. See yeah. that and you're like, oh, I'm not like that. Yeah. <laughs> Where yeah. In, in reality, it's... It's fake to a degree. It's acting. Yeah. Yeah. That's all, that's all it is. It's acting. Yeah. Yet we, especially if you get caught up in it at such a young age, you feel like that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Then as, as you said, it affects our intimacy, like intimate relationships. And I feel that's why this, there is such a rift in society, in relationships now, because if you're not getting what porn is giving you, you're just like, oh, I don't want it. Absolutely breakups, divorces. Yeah. And then you just get guys sitting in their basement whacking off the porn all day. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. Essentially, yeah. And it's, it's you know, the same thing with uh, like even casual sex. Like I've stopped doing casual sex because it's not meaningful. And casual sex is almost like using someone else's body to masturbate. I'm like, why would I do that? Like mm. I'm seeking for connection and seeking for something special. And so that was completely take, taken away from uh, from me my decision, of course. And, um, and now I seek for fulfillment. I seek for the actual meaningful connections. Do you find it's hard to resist? Like you're a good looking bloke and you've, you've been on the show, like <laughs> you're a model and you're going to have girls coming into your inboxes all the time. Is it hard for you to resist it? Especially when you're probably younger? Yeah. Uh, not really. Um, it's a really interesting question. I, I love good communicators and I love people that come to me with uh, good words, um, deepness, with depth. I think that's the introvert thing. We love deep connection and deep conversation. Yeah. Like if you slide into my DMs and I said this before, like with a, with a nice message, like, and it's happened, like, you know, let's connect, like let's share some passion, some values, or, you know, this intrigues me about you. And I'm like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. I'm really, I want to get to know you. This really intrigues me. So, uh, I don't find it difficult because 
like social media does not offer to me that level of depth at the moment. Mm. People are lacking it. Like I, I even came off the dating apps because they were driving me nuts. Like you go on a dating app and I've set my profile up pretty nicely with what I want, with what I'm looking for. Um, and then I just feel that most people are just not committed. Like they use it as a bit of a, uh, like let's chase this dopamine effect. You know, I picture most girls or guys maybe just using the dating apps but on the toilet five yep. minutes. And I'm like, this is, it, and it was getting to the point where I, it was detrimental to my mental health. So I just took them off. You find it's hard to now actually find someone and find a relationship because of these dating apps? You know what I've, what I've, the question that I asked myself was this, was, is my future partner going to be on dating apps? I thought to myself, perhaps, but, but maybe not. So where would, where would she hang out? She would hang out in, at the beach. She would hang out in maybe personal development events. She would, she would hang out in mindfulness events. And so the way for me to find my partner is to put myself out there and first and foremost, be the person I want to attract and then also um, hang out in the places where she will be. And so, yeah, that's the, the action I'm taking now. Quick one. This podcast is now sponsored by Savvy Beverages, the 100% all natural brain boosting nootropics drink. Savvy have actually just revamped all their flavors. And let me tell you, they are amazing. My favorite flavor being the mixed berry, but they also have lime and a new flavor, passion fruit. But I'll be honest, taste is not the only reason why I love Savvy. I used to struggle with coffee, any sort of energy drink, anything that had caffeine in it, I could not have because it would set off anxiety within me. Now, what I love about Savvy is it has a two to one ratio of caffeine and a little ingredient called L thionine. Now, here's the kicker L thionine allows you to experience the energy boost of caffeine without those pesky, anxious side effects. It's honestly a game changer and it's why I continue to drink Savvy. So if you're interested in trying out Savvy Beverages for yourself, head over to their website at www.savvybeverage.com.au. The link will be in the description. And as a special treat, they're offering an exclusive discount just for you. So use my discount code BETTER20. So that's B-E-T-A-R 20 during your checkout to receive 20% off your order. Let's get back to the episode. Talk to me about self-love. How... How do we cultivate that self-love? Because there's, there's so many men out there that just don't love themselves at all. Mm -hmm. They're just like, I hate my life. I hate myself. For you, how, what piece of advice would you give the Jimmy that's listening to the podcast? He's sitting at home. He's, he's hating life, but he, he wants to love himself, but he just can't. Yeah. How does he do that? Yeah, that's a loaded question. Yeah. And I think coming, coming from me where I didn't love myself back in the day, it started off, it started all from looking after my health and, and my body. I started look, I started eating well, working out. And as I started to take those steps, I started to feel good. I had some endorphins in my body. I was, I saw some changes in my body and it didn't happen overnight. It happened over six months, but that made me feel really, really good. And as I felt good, I wanted to do more things that made me feel good. And for me, self-love all happens when you start to leave your head and you go into your heart. And so finding all of those activities or practices that are a bit more mindful um, and that can really help you connect with yourself first and foremost, and then with other people who are interested in that, in that space. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. For you, what is love? Because I seen, seen on your page, you said love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. So what is love to you? Love is the most... Love is the strongest energy that exists in the world. Love is the only lesson that us humans are here on this planet to learn. Um, and, you know, we, we come, we're, we're born as, as babies and we have, we kind of have past traumas or we go through trials and tribulations that will give us limiting beliefs or give us trauma. But at the end of the day, the moment that we are aware of this and the moment that we start cultivating practices that allow us to have self-love um, and be compassionate and be loving, then we become this beautiful energy that no matter what happens around us, we can uphold integrity, we can uphold our beliefs, our values. And so for me, love is someone who um, just oozes compassion, has 
pure awareness and is just somebody that wants to impact and be uh, really useful in in today's society and 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 and, and, and the world and planet. Mm. And it all stems from you loving yourself. You got to love yourself before you can love someone else. Yeah, it all starts from us. Why do you feel as a society, people give up too easily when it comes to love, when it comes to relationships? As you said, it's a choice to turn up every day and love that person. You may have a rough period with whoever you're interacting with or in that relationship, but you still have to turn up and, and choose to love that person. Mm-hmm. Yet so many people, as you said before, the divorce rates are so high. Yes. Why are we giving up? Yeah. That's a good question. I think that we give up because first and foremost, we don't believe in ourselves and we don't love ourselves. When we start to love ourselves, when we start to believe in ourselves, when we do the inner work, we then start to have certain boundaries that help us only commit or give our energy to people that, in quote unquote, deserve it without being, you know, in, obviously said, said that with love. And, um, and when we know who we are looking for, then... Um, we are able to give love to that person. That's a really good point because this podcast is around men's mental health. Yeah. And there's the way I see see this space is a lot of men go down those dark paths because they don't love themselves. They feel like, they, one, they're not connected to themselves. Mm-hmm. They don't have that self-love. They're not connected within mind, body, spirit. And then they feel like no one else loves them mm-hmm. or they can't be in a relationship because there's past traumas or insecurities or anything like that. What is your advice for these for these men that feel like they're just in a rut? Yeah. How do we get out of it? Yeah. Because it's it's all good to, I said about, about this before, yelling affirmations in the mirror. That's not how you build the confidence. That's not how you build the self-love. Yes, that's that's a piece of the puzzle. But for you, what actionable steps can we take? Yeah. Because that's, that's what this podcast is about. It's about cultivating that awareness like hey i'm in a shit place right now but what are the actual steps that i can take to get out of this? yeah well first and foremost it's awareness so i know that i'm in a shit place i feel i'm in a shit place it's okay to be in a shit place because it's it's part of life second is going to be action so what actions can i take i will i would personally reach out to someone and say hey i'm in a shit place right now and i don't quite know what to do that person will perhaps help me or that person will put me in contact with somebody else that can help me. And so that, w- that would be the action, taking those steps that can allow me to let go of those limitations, let go of the, f- of the fear of not being enough, let go of any other fear that I have. And then little by little, day by day, becoming 1% better, 1% better. So taking care of my health, taking care of my mental health. And even if it comes to going to therapy, I mean, I've done that many, many times. Um, there's this there's, there's, there's beauty and power in talking to someone about what you think your your problems are and then them giving you another perspective. It's incredibly powerful. And I think as men as well, what's really important is to have other men that we can talk to, other men that we can just let know what we're feeling, why we're feeling, um, and really coming back to that, that brotherhood. There's so much pressure on us men that we have to be tough. We have yep. to be, you know, um, the the... The, the man of the family like we can't show emotions we've got to be tough but in reality we have uh, emotions we are allowed to feel and we also should always open up because if we don't open up then we become like that jimmy that you said in the cabin that is becoming more and more not himself on on man on masculinity how do you define masculinity what what is a man to you in this day and age? Yeah, uh, a man to me, a man to me, it's someone who has direction, someone who uh, has certainty, someone who can provide. But I also understand that uh, we have a balance of masculine and feminine. Like throughout my life, I didn't really have a, a father figure as per se. Um, I had mostly my mom, and so I was surrounded by feminine energy, and I became someone who was a lot more comfortable in my feminine energy. I understood that I needed to have a balance. And so I started hanging out with male guys, male friends, and that brought it out for me. So for me, it's yes, being a man, yes, being on purpose, yes, having direction, but it's also knowing when to balance these energies out. Mm. Did that impact you a lot growing up and not having that connection with your father? Because I know it, it impacted me. Like mm-hmm. my dad was always in my life, but we never had a strong connection. I was a big mummy's boy. So like a, a lot of that feminine energy. So I wasn't really masculine growing up and it's not only until the last couple of years where 
I've surrounded myself with with masculine men and understanding the energies that I'm like, okay, bring this in. It's like having that balance of feminine and masculine. So did that impact you not having that, I guess, father figure growing up? Um, At the time, I didn't think it did. And I still don't think it did. But in hindsight, uh, with the awareness that I have now, it, fuck, it's a long story, but essentially, I I did ayahuasca a few months ago, and that just oh, a few months ago. What was that experience like? Because that's something that I want to dive oh, into, bro. It was I went I went in it thinking I am gonna expand my consciousness, I'm gonna have the best time. I knew it was gonna be a healing journey, but not to that extent. And so when I when I went in, I was, I did two two ceremonies, Saturday, a Friday and a Saturday. Um, and, um, and yeah, I was confronted first and foremost with my limiting beliefs, with limitations, with, uh, some stuff that I had to address, which was mostly my fear of being judged. Um, and if, I don't know if people here are listening know what ayahuasca is, but essentially it's, um, you, you take this, this liquid, this tea plant bed. It tastes like shit, eh? It tastes like shit. There's DMT in there. <laughs> it's a, it's a full on hallucinogenic. And when you take it, you lose sense of space and time. You forget how to use your body. So it's just you with your spirit and that's it it's just energy colors energy that's it um and it took me on the second night on this deep hole where i could feel my father i could see my father i could feel lots of pain i was unaware of that pain because i had no idea it was there but ayahuasca was showing me all this pain that i had to work with and when you do an ayahuasca the really powerful thing is that people that have done maybe years of psychology or psychotherapy or antidepressants nothing works then then they then go into ayahuasca and because ayahuasca can like uh, encourages you to do the work on yourself then you heal those parts and you come out of it and you're like a different person and so i knew this and when i felt that pain i just started pouring love on it pour love pour love and i started purging and um in ayahuasca when you purge you're letting go of all these negative blockages and emotions that are stored into your body for sometimes even years and once you release it, then you release the pain, you release the trauma, and you're a completely different person. When I went home, I called my mom and I was like, mom, this happened in ayahuasca. I saw my dad, I saw pain, I don't know what it is, like, tell me more. My mom just starts crying over Zoom and she's like, Thomas, I never told you this, but you were being rejected by your father so many times. You want to go there, I want to play with him. And he would always push you out of the living room. He would close the door on you. And he would be crying out of his door wanted to play with him. I had no idea. And so um, when you asked me if that affected me, I didn't think it did. But now that I know this information and exactly why certain behaviors that I had were because of that. Yeah, it was subconscious. It was affecting you, but you didn't know. It. Yeah. It wasn't conscious. Yeah, wow. And now I'm, uh, I'm at a point now where I'm 36 and I'm thinking, fuck, I actually still got to do lots of work to heal that little boy. A little boy is still inside of me and he's still craving the attention of my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a bit of resent or anger towards towards your dad now, or have you worked through that? I worked through that. Yeah, I worked through that. I just there's there's just a part of me that just doesn't understand still why why it's there. Um, and um, and there's definitely just a little bit of sadness that I need to work. As I, as I'm talking, I get it. I'm getting emotional, so I can feel it. So it's a really interesting um, feeling to 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 be had at, at this at, at this age, not knowing. For the past like twenty, you know, what is thirty four years? I appreciate you sharing that because I've been on a similar journey. I mentioned I never had a strong connection with my father, and that stems from when I was a baby. Mm. So anytime he would come near me, I would like cry and want like nothing to do with him. I never knew that until I had my own daughter, and Mum's like, yeah, like, because I would see my dad with my daughter. I'm like, this is not my dad. This is a totally different person. He's like, yeah. never liked that with me, and Mum's like, yeah. Like, when you're a baby, you never wanted anything to do with him. And I sat there and I think, imagine if my daughter did that to me, how how heartbroken I would be knowing that your own child doesn't really want much to do with you. And would you have like an element of resent towards your own child? And taking that step back and looking at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, wow, I have so much empathy towards my, my dad because I had, I had anger, I had resent towards him. But through doing the inner work, and I, I did this really deep breath work. It was like a long 30-minute one, DMT shit. Um, a vision came up with me of a little boy, and I went to hold someone's hand, and it was my dad's hand. And as soon as I grabbed his hand, I shifted into like my adult version. And I'm like, Dad, I love you. I forgive you. I have so much love and empathy towards you. Um, like I never understood all this stuff. And 
after that, it was like what well, you said, purging, like this feeling in my body, like getting rid of all this weird energy stuff. And I was like, what is happening to me right now? And ever since that day, I don't have anger. I don't have it, resent towards him. Like just love and empathy. Like it's not condoning everything that happened when I was younger, but it's like, I understand now. And once you let go of that anger, that resent, how free do you feel? Because once you, if you have all that negative energy in you, like it holds you down. And for me, I, I felt like I couldn't go out and do the, like achieve the things I want to achieve. It was like, oh, you know, I had all this, because of what happened, I had a lack of confidence, lack of self-worth. But once I let go of that, bro, the confidence, my self-worth came through. I'm like, I don't achieve anything I want. You've got to do the inner work. Yeah. And so the very similar journeys, um, that's why I feel so connected um, because, you know, you being vulnerable and opening up better, that's why I said thank you so much because this is what these conversations are about. Yeah. There's going to be people listening to this and like, Nick shared this, Thomas shared this. I've been through something similar. I'm not the only one because we, f- as men, we feel like we are the only one. This is why we, we bottle up all our emotions until it gets to the top and it's like, what do I do now? And it explodes. And sadly, we lose eight men a day to suicide. When these conversations, imagine if we're having these every day. Can prevent that. Yeah. I 100% believe suicide is preventable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Conversations, taking the actionable steps, putting your health as a number one priority, like mind, body, spirit, doing the inner work. Is, there's so many men which are actually just trapped boys inside. 100%. Like we, we all, we all, we all have that inner child mm. and wants that, wants attention. And, you know, most of us have, well, most of us, some of us have done the work and they are free, you know, they've practiced forgiveness like you've done. And that's just something so powerful. But then when you think about it as well, like when you don't look, when you don't attend that inner child, sometimes the, 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 the sound can become so loud and loud and loud. And then it turns into like some sort of physical pain. You know, your shoulder starts hurting, you get migraines, you don't understand why. People are taking medications because they think they just have migraines, but in reality, it's trauma not attended coming out louder and louder and louder because the body wants you to take care and actually see what's going on. And if you're not aware, if you're not awake, if you don't understand, then more and more complications happen. So, yeah. 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 Your internal pain shows up physically as a sign for you to actually take action on it. Yeah. Yeah. So many people don't see it. Yeah. As I said, they pop the pills. It's not going to help. Not going to help. Until you deal with your inner stuff, it's just going to keep coming up. Yeah. I'm talking about ayahuasca. For me, when I think people tell me like, how was it? And I was like, fuck, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But it was also the most rewarding because I was, it's almost like, okay, I am going to put the armor on. I'm going to go fucking battle my demons. And I'm going to come out of it like a warrior because I've confronted my darkest, deepest, most fucked up demons. And, and then you come out of it thinking, fuck, I've done it. Mm. Light warrior. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a big thing there, fear of judgment. Mm. Where, where did that stem from? Because it's a big thing in society. We, mm. we don't tend to do anything outside the box because we're scared of what people are going to think. Mm-hmm. One, where did that stem from for you? And then two, why do you think it's such a societal issue? Um, it's... It happened to me when I was around 12 to 14. I used to be a fat kid. I used to be very chubby. Mm-hmm. And um, I had changed school and cities a few times. And when I went to this one city where I grew up in particular, initially there were some bullies making fun of me, making fun of my physical appearance. And uh, that sent me down some rabbit holes of self-judging and not being happy with myself. And I went from being fat to anorexic and then chubby and then anorexic again and that just caused yo-yo yes yo-yo completely like i was you know making myself throw up at at night time after meals and stuff it was hectic that's where the fear of judgment happened for me um and it took a while for me to get rid of that um and uh, my gosh society i think there's so many things that we can talk about but like you know social media is definitely one of them like comparing yourself to others, like you compare yourself to someone who has, or at least shows that has success on social media without actually knowing what's going on in their life. And that can be like a very detrimental use. Um, and obviously ways that we were brought up, conditions, like there's many factors that can come into place. Mm. What advice would you give to someone that 
is caught up in the the mindset of caring what everyone else thinks. How do we let go of that? I have one piece of advice that my mentor gave me, and he said, Thomas, you should only take advice from people who have what you want. Um, and I, for the most part, I love people that are happy. I love people that are on purpose and I don't do gossip and I don't do drama. And so I would only take advice from people who have the success that I want and that are good people at the core. So if people do not have that, and if people, I assume, do not pay your bills, just don't take advice from them. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're not going to get surgery from a lawyer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or you're not going to be trained by an overweight personal trainer. Absolutely. Like you want to learn from the people in the position or doing the things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. I want to play a little game. So yeah. I got at least the 22 questions here. Yeah. We're not going to go through them all, but pick a number between one and 22. Okay. That's going to be the question. Okay. Nine. Nine. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give your younger self when you were experiencing the most significant tragedy in your lives? Uh, four. I would tell him that, um, I would tell him to trust my gut feeling and I would tell him to do those things that I know would get me out of that state. So essentially I would teach him how to, how to manage my state. State management is one of the things that I've learned a few years ago that I still do every single day that's had a big impact on my life. And so... Obviously, we either we can we can affect people or infect people, right? And so, when I used to have a um, bit of mental health uh, problems where I wasn't feeling enough and all of that, I soon realized that because I was in this negative, low vibrational state, I would always attract negative and low vibrational results in people. And so, state management taught me that I had the choice to stay in that state or had the choice to change it. And you change your state through physiology, so through moving your body, um, exercise, cold shower, you know, dance, burpees, whatever whatever you want, uh, walk in the park, you change it through what you focus on. So if I'm focusing on negative things, then I'm gonna keep attracting mm -hmm. them. So changing your focus through listening to a podcast, different perspective, um, doing some affirmations and believing them. And lastly, you change it through language. So whenever I talk to people, I, I can straight away understand what kind of person they are by the language they're using. I'm tired. I can't. I can't afford it. I won't. Yes, you won't with that attitude, of course. If you don't change that, you're not going to change. And so when I learned that, I now know that if I am ever in a low vibrational state, I can change it. And I know it sounds easier said than done, but once you have these little techniques, you can say, okay, I'm in a really shit mood today. I don't want to talk to anyone. I can either do this or I can go for a run. Or I can get in a cold shower. Or I can do some burpees and listen to Jim Rohn or put on a podcast. And then I got the choice to change the way I show up in my day. And that would really help me back in the day when I had some suicidal thoughts near a pool. <laughs> uh, so you actually thought about it? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah. What was that period like for you? It was awful. This was the time when I broke up with a girlfriend in Italy. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, and yeah, I was laying next to the pool and I was thinking to myself, I'm just going to drown myself. I was, I was, I felt hurt. I didn't feel seen. I thought that my world was crumbling, and um, and I didn't do it because I thought to myself, if I do this now, I don't want my mom to find my body. I don't want to be that person for my mom. So I was like, fuck this. And then I, I that's when I went and looked for opportunities to go to America. You took action. Really. Yeah. Not letting a. The way I say it is not letting a short-term emotion allow you to make a long-term decision. Good one. Yeah. So many men, there's a short-term emotion of I broke up, lost my job. That's not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. But you ending your life is. Absolutely. It's Yeah, it's, it's a big thing. It's, it's, it's fucking hard, man. Hard. We get caught up. We do get caught up in emotions. We could do all the work that we want in the world. But there's going to be, life's going to hit. Yeah. It's always going to hit. Yeah. But as long as you have these tools, you can you can best get through it. Absolutely. And as long as you have people in your circle, people that you can go to, podcasts, man, anything's possible. Yeah. It's like what you said before, like when you said, uh, you know, bad days. So I don't believe in bad days. And I'm like, sometimes you talk to people and I say to you, oh God, I've had a really bad week. I'm like, fuck, 
How did you have a bad week? How the fuck did you do that? I mean, I understand if things go wrong, but like, it's your choice to change the way that you approach and see things. So I can have a bad moment or a bad situation. And then the way that I act on that moment or whatever situation is how I then decide how to show up. And so bad moment, yes, but don't let the bad moment affect your mood to the point where it becomes a bad day or a bad week. Some people even say to me, I've had a really bad year. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's letting that one bad moment, like they let it compound into many more. And because they're in that negative mindset, you said you attract more into your life. Yeah. And, you know, I've experienced it, you've experienced it when you feel shit. And it's like, oh, fuck, 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 fuck. And then more stuff cups. It. Yeah. It's like, why are they? I'm having such a bad day. It's like, no, man, you just let that one bad moment compound. Correct. But you can do the exact opposite. Let a good moment compound. You have a good day, yeah. good week, heaps of good moments. Yeah. And imagine when you build that good momentum, the things you're going to achieve. Yes. The biggest thing I've, I've learned from successful people is momentum is so important. You need to hang on to that shit and let it keep growing. Like the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Yes. You can do that in your own personal life. Yes. Let's hit you with another question. What's your number? Uh, 11. 11? If you could only have one guiding principle to use for the rest of your life, what would it be? Your energy introduces you before you even speak. So energy management and vibrational management. I'm very, very big, as you can tell, on energy. And I understand the, the consciousness map and the consciousness map and vibrational chart. And so for me, energy management. Energy is my currency. Ensuring that every single day, always, my energy is always high. If it's not high, I don't leave the house. Really? Yeah. So you wake up one morning, you don't have energy, you don't leave the house. How do you get that energy back? You go back to sleep or you? what do you do? No, no. I, I actively, I will actively meditate. Yeah. Breath work, cold shower, exercise. It's usually just one of those two works, one of those four works. But if I'm having a really bad moment, yeah, then I'll do all four. Okay. Have you had a day where you've done all four and you still feel bad? Um, I have. I, I, yes, definitely. I have had those days because of what has circumstances. Mm -hmm. and so in those cases, I just allow myself to feel. Um, I don't judge. I observe the thoughts. I try to understand why I'm feeling a certain way. And then I forgive. I'm compassionate and I let go. I have to sit in it for a little bit to understand what was, what's going on. And then I forgive. I'm yeah. Go. You have to see in your feelings. I, I when it comes to like depression, what is it? Deep depression. Yes. Sometimes you just need a rest. Yes. Listen to your body. Mm. You don't always, like, yes, you have to work through it, but in the initial stages, like, just rest up sometimes. Yeah. It's sometimes it's just a sign like, hey, man, you're doing too much. Yeah. Have a day off. Have a couple of hours just to, just to chill. Just to chill. Recharge the batteries, then go after it again. Yeah. It's pretty important for your nervous system to understand that. Talk to me about, manifesting visualization because there's so many like i don't want to offend you but bondi hippies mm -hmm. that just say oh yeah affirmation sit in your chair visualize a million dollars all that crap it doesn't work mm -hmm. so for you how do we manifest how do we visualize and it actually work yeah totally um i was just seeing if you had that book there but the the book that got me into it was think and grow rich by napoleon hill do I have any? I know I have it in Solid. Yeah. So they, uh, they got ago. it. Yeah. So obviously he's really big on manifesting. And uh, I guess first and foremost, it comes with one simple question. Why? Why do you want what you what you want? Why do you want a good relationship? You know, the, the abundance, the, the the success, the body. Why, 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 why? Get Getting clear with our why first. And so this for some people might sound very woo-woo for many men. Also, I was one of them, so I understand. Uh, and I was very much um, rejecting spending time alone, understanding my why, because I just didn't want to do it. It was very, uh, I felt really, really uneasy doing it because I, it meant for me taking a knee and understanding my feelings, which I wasn't quite connected to. It's being vulnerable. It's being vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're doing it with yourself, it's still scary. Yeah. 
because a lot of shit can come up and you're like, oh, I don't really want to deal with that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you start for the first time meditating or doing yoga, you're like, fuck that. I can be in a room for an hour with just my thoughts. That's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And so getting really clear with your why. So I always, I have done, this is my practice. So I will take a couple of hours. I put some binaural beats on or some music with no sound. And I just write down my vision and why I want to achieve this. You know, who will I become once I achieve this? Why is it important for me? I uh, picture in my ideal day, my ideal feelings. And I get really familiar with it. I start to feel it. I start to see it. I start to believe it. Lots of people tell me, I will only believe it once I see it. And I say, you would only see it once you believe it. If you don't believe it, you're not going to manifest it because you're going to, you, you're going to, um, what's what I'm looking for? This is my Italian coming out. So I apologize. You're going to sabotage yourself if you don't believe it. Um, and so first and foremost, getting clear with your why, feeling it, seeing it. And then afterwards, it's about putting down some goals, some actionable steps. So, so for example, if my goal is to make $1 million, how am I going to do that? I need to start to think about business, businesses that can help me with leveraging my time. Um, so I start to think about some ways that I can do it. And then I start to break, break it down in actionable steps in terms of time. So the million dollars will probably come in two years. What can I do each day to get to that step? Or I want to lose 20 kilos. Okay, realistically, I will lose 20 kilos in probably 16 weeks. Every day, I'm going to be walking 10,000 steps. I'm going to be eating 300 calories less than what I usually do. I'm going to be up, I'm going to be drinking my three, three liters of water. I'll sleep seven hours. Okay, that seems feasible. I can do that. And then compound, I lose 20 kilos after that. So having the actionable steps. So why, vision, feel, and then the actions. What are some of your goals at the moment? Oh, I've got so many goals. What are your main ones that you're like super pumped for? Yeah, I've uh, I've written two books. And so at the moment, I am heavily focused on finishing the books. It's like giving birth for a man, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, and I just cannot wait to get these babies out. To talk, the world. talk to me about it. What are, they, what are they about? Why did you even want to write a book? Yes. Um, I am really passionate when it comes to helping people. That's, that's my purpose. My purpose is just to be this bright light and... Um, uh, hope for for people and uh, I have studied lots I've got lots of philosophies and for me a book is a way of like writing down some actionable steps some philosophies some stories like I'm no guru I always say this I'm just somebody that has done the work and I'm very fulfilled I'm very happy and very successful and for me it was just about giving this knowledge out to the world and I know that when, once once people open this book and they can read and they can implement then I've done my job and I'm fulfilled and so for me, it's just having that vehicle that can help thousands of people, help the person that I used to be even. What does connection mean to you? And on a deep level, what does authentic connection mean to you? Authentic connection. That is such a good question. You've got some really good questions, right? I applaud you for that. Authentic connection is, um, for me, it's all about being in my heart. So having... Knowing what I stand for, knowing what my values are, and then connecting through values, through interest to another person. Um, and I am someone that doesn't really like to do, you know, small talk or yeah, I hate it. chit chat. <laughs> uh, and I'm someone that says, okay, like, you know, show me your soul. Like, you know, what are your, what's your big dream? Um, why do you do what you want to do? And those conversations really fulfill me because through a beautiful question like you just asked me, you can understand what my passions are or my goals are. I can open up to you. And once I open up to you, then we connect. And then that, that's when the conversation really starts. And I feel that if I'm in my heart and you're in your head, we're not going to connect. But once we both take that little journey and connect heart to heart, then that's when the magic really happens. Mm, yeah, my main priority as a podcast host is is to connect and create that authentic connection. The way I see it is it's through vulnerability. Mm. Now, vulnerability is an emotional risk, right? Mm -hmm. It's fucking scary. You don't want to be vulnerable. Like, what are they going to say? What are their judgments? But once you take that risk, that, that leap of faith, and you open up and you be vulnerable, it's like, okay, cool. He shared that with me. Now, I'm going to be vulnerable back. And through that vulnerability creates that authentic connection. Yes. And then we can connect through, as you said, through our hearts. Yeah. And that's where the best conversations come from. 
Yeah. Because we're not all up here. We're, we're from the heart. Speaking from here, we're speaking from past experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I love having these conversations and I love having guests that come into this studio with an open mind, mm -hmm. open heart to be able to sit down and be vulnerable. So, yeah, I, man, I thank you for coming in here today and, and sharing what you've shared. Man, my pleasure. My pleasure. I feel... um there's there's something so magical in being vulnerable like i feel that being vulnerable is a superpower because once you are okay with with your shit and you've made peace with it you know that being vulnerable is going to inspire someone that listens and as humans we i mean i don't know about you but i i'm i'm here to help people progress through whatever i've been through it can be little it can be small but every single one listening to this as well like we've all got something that when we start sharing it we can help someone and it starts by being vulnerable. Definitely. Is is there anything else you want to leave the listeners on or any other topics that you want to touch on before we jump off? Um, well, the main thing that I really focus on that I love is just that beautiful mind, body, and spirit connection. Um, I was a lost soul. I didn't quite know what my future looked like, but the moment that I started looking after my body, first and foremost, my mind and my spirit, everything changed. So um, if you can take something away from me, it's just having creating a routine where you are connecting your mind, will and spirit every single day. And when your books come out, definitely for all the listeners, though, <laughs> go check it out. Please. We have a closing tradition on the podcast where the previous guest leaves a question for the next guest without knowing who it is. So the question for you today, Thomas, is what do you value most in life and why? Um, one of my I've got, I've got, I've got a couple, but I'm going to say the thing that I value the most in life is growth. Growth is my highest value. And, uh, as I said before, it's the one thing that fulfills me. It's the one thing that the more I progress in life, the more I feel fulfilled. And so I really value growth in friendships in in, in relationships in business and just having that growth mindset every single day where I just become like just one person better every single day even on a relationship finding someone to me that has a growth mindset is really really important um and when I'm growing I'm really happy and that's my my biggest um I think my most important thing to do every, every single day do you feel like you're fulfilled right now like yeah yeah very yeah gonna be a lot more fulfilled when, when these books come out <laughs> it's on my mind the whole time <laughs> Man, where can, the, where can the listeners find you, support everything that you're doing? Thanks, man. So I'm mostly active on Instagram, Thomas Maluccelli. Um, also Facebook, but mostly Instagram. And I've got my email there. If anybody wants to ask me like a question or send me an email, I'll happily respond and happy to connect. Thomas Maluccelli. Thank you, my man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. It's been an amazing conversation. If you got some value out of today's episode, please remember to like, share, subscribe. Check out Thomas. Check out his socials. When his books come out, go check them out as well. And yeah, once again, thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.